Guys, you're here to learn about stucco. Stucco claims, we call it envelope penetration. You can't say penetration without getting a laughter from somebody. That's because there are 12 year old boys yes. in the group. <laughs> So I'm Bill Underkopfler. This is Steve Feinstein with uh, Gallant Law. Is it Scott Gallant Law? Is that the name of the firm? Ask Gallant Law. Ask Gallant Law. Uh, we're going to teach the class together today. Uh, we actually have changed our format a little bit. We've added attorneys to a lot of the classes as a lot of arguments become legal ones. And uh, so if we have questions or we can stop throughout the way, Mitch is monitoring the online traffic. So if somebody has a question online, we can interrupt and ask also. Uh, stucco claims tend to be one of the large claims. You know, these I just I've had this situation with my own home, uh, where I had a stucco failure scenario. Uh, the repair to that was about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars, and I have a brand new home. So I mean, they can be really big dollars. So if you understand stucco, even when you don't have a stucco loss, you generally have related losses or coverages, like water damage to hardwood floors interior water damage, or hidden decay coverages. They all fall into play with that. First slide up there is the Appia membership. Please make sure you are registered with Appia or your CEs get billed when we process them through the state. Uh, it's much cheaper to be an Appia member. It's only $75 and uh, we'll get you started. All right, looks may be deceiving. A stucco house may look absolutely perfect. Uh, the damages or the claim is generally not something that you're gonna walk up to and see. Uh, the house appears to be a beautiful mansion, mini mansion, with no visible damage. So you're not gonna identify stucco claims based on a drive-by. You will identify stucco claims because you look at them and they have stucco. That means there's a stucco claim there. Little bit of history, I was a contractor for 10 years before becoming a public adjuster, almost 30 years ago. So the contracting time was 40 years ago. And we did many homes to stucco and I still know of those homes today and they have no stucco failure. The building industry changed along the way and building materials changed along the way and they never redesigned how stucco was to be put on a house or how it was to be made. So then the building boom comes and they're starting to use new materials and faster methods and all these changes being put together, no one ever took into consideration how it might affect stucco. I'll give you a really quick example of what changed. They put Tyvek on the back of a house, on the outside of a house, which is a vapor barrier, instead of tar paper. Tar paper, would wrinkle when it got wet. So you put the tar paper on the whole house the night before, they would staple wire over it to apply the stucco and it would wrinkle. And those wrinkles were actually what was keeping stucco from rotting out the house. They didn't know that. The wrinkles created airflow behind the stucco, no direct contact with the masonry, therefore it never rotted out the framing behind it. If you ever picked up a doormat that's got a wrinkle in it, after it's been now you know, weeks since it rained, the doormat's still wet everywhere but the wrinkle because that was the airflow. So all of a sudden they built all these homes with a tight connection between the stucco and the Tyvek. You have 9 million staple holes. You have different kinds of weeping from windows that no longer have the ability to self dry. That's what really created the phenomena. Any word there or? Well, you're addressing something that is a major concern uh, in the construction industry now. And one of the primary reasons why the Attorney General's office filed suit against at least one builder, I think it was Cutler. It was my builder. Um, and for improper installation of stucco, given the weather conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Now, a copy of that complaint is available online if you cannot find it. And I do suggest that you find it and read it. Email me at sgallantlaw, excuse me, sfeinstein at sgallantlaw.com. I'll be happy to send you a copy of it so you become familiar with the 
issues that the Attorney General has raised with regard to widespread problems with stucco installation and why they're failing. So that, that case actually cost me a lot of money. Uh, when the Attorney General filed that, it meant that every home he ever built, he might be... Hello, liable. hello. Hey, Bill. Steve. Yes. Excuse me. We do have a pretty good question, kind of back to your opener here from Marshall Israel. Does, does envelope penetration apply to all homes? Yes, it does. Yes, anything that bre breaches the envelope. Actually, if you read the case Steve just referred to, it talks about the building code, and it basically says that you have to build a home no matter what you have to do to keep it water resistant from weather events. And they were unable to do that. They didn't keep up with that standard. So it's in there. So that house we just saw online like that, when you take off the stucco, look how rotted out that house is underneath. It is covered in mold, rot, decompression. In, in many places, the plywood is falling apart. It's paper mache. It's into the framing. It's into the insulation. Sometimes it's even affected the electrical system, uh, hitting wires on the exterior. So this will actually get to the point where it will cause structural failures. But that's what that house looks like, just pulling off that perfectly normal looking stucco on the exterior. You're gonna see things like this, which are a good indication of stucco failure. This is where the actual stucco membrane, the exterior of the home, is becoming dislodged. So it's becoming dislodged because the material it's fastened to is rotting away. Therefore, the stucco has no ability to stay there and it moves and shifts with weather and ice and everything else. It's not specifically connected to the house any longer. And if you follow it back, it generally starts at windows where you get water penetrations. You take a look at the one kind of in the center, it's coming off of there. Once that water gets behind the stucco and it freezes, it starts blowing the stucco apart, just like you see in the image there. So it, it actually can be a one-time occurrence. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're gonna get an, a, a lack of argument, but it absolutely can be a one-time occurrence. I've seen this occur. Now, granted, the buildup to the damage may have taken a long time, but the fact that the day that it occurred and the day the water got in there and the day it froze can be a sudden and accidental event. Steve? Well. It leads to a, sec a secondary question, though, because virtually every claim that you submit that looks like that is going to be denied by the carrier, and they're going to deny it for improper installation. And that's going to happen, as I said, almost every single time. But there's a way around improper installation. And the way around it is, assuming the, the policy has an ensuing loss provision, the ensuing loss is covered. So what's behind the stucco that's damaged, that becomes decayed, it doesn't necessarily matter that it's happening over a period of time. But if the, if the sheathing behind the stucco becomes damaged, that's the ensuing loss. To access that and repair what is covered under the policy, they're going to have to take off and, re and reinstall or, or put on the stucco again. So that becomes a necessary component of the repair to um, address the portion of the claim that is covered under the policy. Under the policy. So whether, and they're gonna come back and say, but we said that the stucco is improperly installed. We're not asking for it because it's improperly installed. We're asking for it because it's a necessary component to repair what is covered under the policy. And that way it should be covered and that is the argument that I'd be making if the case came to me in litigation. So you're, we will make claim for many items that we actually don't get paid for the item we intended to claim, or technically we did, but we do it backwards. So we've had claims where even with an accidental discharge of water inside the house, where the wall cavity was wet and needed to be dried, the only way to dry the wall cavity was to remove the stucco. Now granted, our goal was the stucco claim. But if we can argue it for a wet wall cavity, and the only way to get that is to remove the stucco to dry the wall cavity, they have to put stucco back, which solves your problem. So in Steve's scenario, when the water hits and causes damage to the substrate, even on a hidden decay coverage policy, Chubb has a hidden decay coverage endorsement, Travelers has a hidden decay coverage endorsement, Erie has a hidden decay coverage endorsement, 
All of those syndicate endorsements say the maximum we will pay under this endorsement is $10,000 or $5,000, depending on we have 25 on Chubb. But that's fine. The hidden decay, we only want our 10 or 20 or 25,000. But you got a DNR of the stucco, right? Well, DNR of the stucco is RNR of the stucco. You can't actually take it off and put it back. No question over there. It is a possibility, but the way stucco is installed today, you probably can't. Uh, so that doormat principle won't allow it to dry. In fact, trying to dry the property from the inside may actually cause more damage. Mm -hmm. So what you're going to do is create such a negative pressure from drying it, you may actually crumble the wall. That'd be great. Let's give it a try, and it actually will break the wall off simultaneously. No, no, if they insisted on an attempt to dry, I'd probably allow it. And then once the wall's access and you see the decay, you automatically have coverage. Now the loss is locked in. I don't really care that they cut off drywall. They're locked into the entire loss. Coverage is now established once they agree to any form of access. Well, in a cinder block scenario, I would argue it's probably not required. So a cinder block is, is a substantially masonry not going to rot or fail or mold product. So drying out a cinder block product is probably going to be access air holes and blowing tubes up through the centers. But on wood framing, it's a really good argument. I don't think you would have a valid argument on a cinder block wall. Mike. Well, the statute of limitations issue isn't a first party issue as far as the improper installation is concerned. It is a, an issue for a third party claim against the manufacturer or the builder of the home. And there's actually two issues that can come up under those circumstances. One is the statute of limitations with regard to um, when an event took place, and there's also a secondary statute called the statute of repose. And under a statute of repose, you can't sue, at least in theory, you can't sue the manufacturer of something if it has been installed in place for more than 12 years. However, um, Pennsylvania 13. Excuse me? Pennsylvania 13. No, it's 12. Okay. And, but, and Bill doesn't know this, but for a very short period of time, I worked for a firm that actually special, specialized in stucco claims. And I asked them while I was there, how do you get around the statute of repose? And they gave me a very interesting answer, and that is that the statute of repose requires that the installation be, um, I don't remember the exact wording, but legal or lawful. And what he said to me was that in each of these circumstances that he's representing the homeowner on, they were not built to code. And because they were not built to code, his argument was they were not lawfully built. And he's been able to get around the statute of repose in that regard. Now, as far as the statute of limitations is concerned, most people believe that the statute of limitations runs from the date of an event. And it can, but not necessarily so. Unlike first party cases where, especially in Pennsylvania, where it's going to run the suit limitations provision is going to run from the date of the event. A statute of limitations really runs from the date of the harm. And if you, can, if you want to think about it, it's the difference between a suit limitations provision and the um, statute of limitations with regard to bad faith. It's when the bad faith um, action occurs and causes harm to the insured. In this scenario, even if the construction was done years ago and it was a problem, the statute of limitations wouldn't be, begin to run until the insured was harmed and had reason to believe that um, it was as a result of the improper installation. So there's something called the discovery rule with regard to that. And you can have a negligent construction, but if it doesn't cause harm to the, to the homeowner, statute of limitations doesn't begin to run until there is harm.
I was actually trying to figure out what this photograph was till I looked up and I read the description. I'm like, yeah, that's what that is. So kick out flashing is missed on most stucco installations. So when you go to a stucco home, whenever there's a vertical wall against roofing, so the garage roof may go into the second story wall or a porch roof goes into another wall and it runs up along that roof. And there's what's known as step flashing in there. Well, step flashing actually has to leave the, to the exterior of the stucco for its last piece. It kicks out in front of the stucco. So it's completely buried. And then the last piece kicks out so that if water gets behind there, it comes down and leaves in front of the stucco. Well, it looks hideous if you don't know how to do it because you have to put this big aluminum kick out right at the bottom of your house. So see where that little crack is on the picture? Is this the laser here? See that little crack? So that's where the step out flashing would go. Uh, and that would allow the, the, that water that runs down this slope to come out in front. Instead, it goes behind eventually. You can see it all runs down here, right? So it's all kicking, it's not kicking out into the gutter. So most homes with stucco built during that period, this, the kick out flashing has all been buried. So they stucco right over it, it looks beautiful, but what you don't realize is this is a code issue not built to code, and therefore Steve's argument of repose also works. But there's many, I would say I've never met a stucco job that was built to code, just to tell you that. I've never had an inspection where the stucco was the proper thickness. I've never met where the Tyvek was installed properly. I've never met where the window pan flashing was correct. I've never met one where it was nailed in the appropriate nail spacing pattern. I've never met one where they've nailed the correct size fasteners. So they're almost a given to prove that they're not to code. Doesn't mean that it won't last 100 years in the right conditions, but in Steve's opening remarks, he talked about uh, we had to build to this area is true. So this exact same home in Florida really won't be an issue because they have so much more sun, so much more evaporative drying, and so much less rain you know, rain or ice, it's dry, it's hot and dry more than it's wet and damp. So our area is not a great area for stucco. We can't hear questions. That's not, that's not, that's not true. So I know the endorsements and how the code words read but no construction can ever be done not to code on any rebuild, meaning replacement cost has to consider in, in proper installation. That's just how replacement cost is calculated. So the code failures, I can't make a claim and say my building is not built to code, please rebuild it. We can't hear the questions. No, nothing is built to the current code when it's built because the code continues to change. So I think I understand. I, 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 I got you. And I understand your question. Steve, do you want to answer that? It's a tough question to answer because a lot of policies have in them code upgrades, and some don't. But I've State always, Farm is ordinance and law. But I've always um, taken the position that you can't pay for a repair that can't be made. Now, because in the entire idea of a replacement cost policy, people talk about restoring the house to its pre-loss condition. That's actually a misnomer, because under a, under a replacement cost policy, since you are buying new, the coverage that's being provided is to put the house in a better condition than it was before the loss. Otherwise, the argument would be, well, I can replace a 20-year roof with a 20-year roof because that's restoring it to its pre-loss condition. Replacement cost policy replaces it with a new roof. So the argument has to be that notwithstanding whether the policy covers something or doesn't cover something expressly, it under a replacement cost policy, in order to comply with the terms and conditions of the policy, you have to pay for code upgrades even if there's an exclusion in the policy for it. 
because you can't allow an insurance company to pay for a repair that can't be made. That language has no teeth with State Farm. We've never lost that language. Uh, it may be an initial denial phase and you know the way it's responded to, but that language is not accurate. It cannot be done, kind of like rotted plywood. So you have roof damage to shingles and you have rotted plywood underneath the roof. Clearly took a period of time to rot the plywood. So we have shingles blow off the roof. The insurance company says, great, we'll pay for the shingles, but we won't pay for the rotted plywood. That's wrong. They owe for what we call a nailable surface. You have to be able to do the repair. You can't say, I'll pay for the shingles, you pay for the roof decking. That's just not, that's not how the policy works. So they owe for the rotted plywood, whether or not, I can't claim the rotted plywood, but they owe for it, even though it wasn't part of my win loss, I need to provide a surface to be able to nail the shingles or I have not adequately addressed the repair. Well, that actually brings up another point, which is, and this, this is an important point that a lot of adjust, field adjusters for the insurance companies do not understand. The mere fact that some component of a repair is not covered under the policy is meaningless. It is, once, the, once the insurance company makes a coverage decision in favor of coverage, now I will talk about the roof specifically. Um, you may come in a circumstance where an insurance company will say, these 20 shingles were blown off and we're not going to pay for the rest of the shingles because they have wear and tear. Even though we agree the entire roof should be replaced. That's an incorrect coverage decision. Because once the decision was made to replace the roof, the pre-existing condition is a question of depreciation. Because, and it's exactly the same idea with what Bill just said. You have to comply with the ability to make the repair. If there are, in fact, um, portions of the claim that wouldn't be covered if you made it for that reason, you can't make the claim for the, for the damaged sheathing because it's rotted. You make the claim for the rotted sheathing because it's a necessary component of the repair. And then the pre-existing condition of it becomes depreciation and not part of the coverage decision. Do you know how many times State Farm adjusters say to me, and I'm saying State Farm, uh, but many adjusters, uh, we don't cover the rotted plywood. Do you know what I say? I say, yes, you do. And they look at me like I'm crazy. And I said, yes, you do. But they've been told that they just don't cover it. They actually don't know. The adjusters are told they don't cover it. Therefore, that's the initial answer. But I get rotted plywood paid for all the time. We get plywood paid for that's three eighths, 90% of the time. So code is seven sixteenths or greater in this coast with under 24 inch centers. Uh, but we get the plywood replaced all the time, uh, even though it wasn't damaged. So real quick, get a look at the stucco. This is a window drainage issue. So this stucco is clearly installed improperly by how far it is out on the window. Uh, so this window is not even caulked to the stucco. That water's running down that side of the window, sneaking in where it hits its first point of resistance, which is that turn, it's getting in there. And it's it literally, if I took a thermal camera, you would see that that is saturated and rotted inside that. You couldn't see it's rotted, but you could tell it was a cold anomaly for sure. Here's typical, by the way. Um, that's what a house looks like in my neighborhood after 14 years old. There was no physical damage to stucco. That's what happens when you pull it off the wall. Can you imagine that that's your brand new $800,000 house? You have no idea it's going on. And that's what's behind the wall. Now, there's a whole host of triggered items right there. That's framing, that's potential collapse, that's hidden decay, that's mold, that's drywall, that's ensuing water. That is all of those potential losses exist in that photograph when getting to that may be the access to the stucco, may be the solution to getting the stucco and hidden decay and hidden rot issues for that will actually trigger that exterior coverage. I don't have anything to add to that, but that's um, all of those are arguments that I'd be making in court if the carrier denied portions of, you know, stucco portions of the claim and it was given to me for litigation. We don't mind uh, denied portions of a claim. It's pretty common to have sections of a claim that don't get paid for. That just means that we have to get paid more for the covered sections. There's usually plenty of room to negotiate those. 
So uh, if you, anyone take the thermal image class today? Not a certified level class, but certainly understand what we're using thermal imagery for. But that class will show you that this is a typical thermal image shot. So obviously this is a, uh, a warm climate summer day because these windows, the frames of the windows are showing up hot, meaning they're red in color. And then beneath that window, we're showing this really cold section inside of that wall. So that really cold section where those blue are most likely, they're not, they aren't for sure, but they're indications that it's, it's holding temperature, most likely related to moisture. I'm, like, I'm not giving you a technical answer. That's the technical side. Most likely that's wet insulation inside the wall. Give you an idea how fast we can tell. We, we're looking at that like this and it's showing us instantly without cutting apart drywall. So now I find some interior damage. So I go in that house and I go underneath that window, underneath the window, and the hardwood floor has got a little bit of buckle. Uh, the drywall is 38%. And I can see the smallest of water stains on the drywall. That's a claim that I, I could potentially get the interior damage and the stucco because the access to it to do the repair because we can prove that the water went from the outside to the inside. The inside looks beautiful, but once I argue that my access to get to do that full repair may include stucco DNR or RNR, that's where you're ending up with your case. If I can add one thing though, and I know what Bill's talking about with regard to his experience. I just want to throw this in. I was recently talking to a PA. I don't remember who or where, but that individual said to me in a claim that was denied for stucco damage, that he or she went, actually went to the builder to get a report from the builder to refute the engineer's report. And I'm not sure it's necessarily gonna work, I'm but she sure did, I think, I think it was a woman, she, told me that in that particular that case, that it did. Case so the, it did. you don't necessarily have to accept the decision from the insurance company that it is in fact um, improper installation, although I can agree it most likely is, but the builder is going to have an incentive to give you this information because although you can't sue or you can't bring a claim against the builder because it's a third party claim, I can. And in these cases, if they were given to us, there's a good chance that we would sue both the insurance company and the builder and let them fight it out as to who is responsible. We're running out of builders that have any insurance coverage left. In the East Coast, they've pretty much all maxed out their policies. Uh, it's such a, we'll call it a pandemic of stucco cases. We have a question. <clears throat> Not really. It would, if it was actively wet, it wouldn't see that. Uh, thermal imagery is so sensitive. If you've played with it yet, uh, Anthony has one at his booth. So if you took that thermal camera and shot the wall, you'd probably be able to see the framing or the electrical in the wall. But do yourself a favor, put your hand on the wall and walk back and do it again. Your handprint is still on the wall from the heat it transferred. Uh, they're that sensitive. Question. We can't so hear most the likely you're talking about a window claim. We can't hear the question. It's pretty rare that building products fail. It's pretty rare. 90 plus percent of elements that we deal with are from installation um, issues. But the building elements rarely fail. Some elements, obviously, that are kind of latent. But for the most part, the window probably won't fail. The way the window was installed, the way the counter flashing was put in, uh, was it level, was it plumb, was it broken along shipment? But if a builder flips you back to the manufacturer, he's just trying to get rid of the problem. Manufacturers almost always deal with whoever installed their product. You can't call back Shaw Manufacturing on this carpet if they installed it and the, and the, the pattern's you know, not correct. The, man, the installer would bring Shaw out and Shaw would say, yep, the carpet's bad. And the manufacturer would reimburse your installer to do the job again. They're putting it off on you because you're not 
holding, they're not holding up their end of the deal, but it, it is most likely the installer's problem. But if I can add, it's really not your concern in the sense that that is a third party matter. And that would be for a litigation issue as to whether the responsibility falls on the builder, the general contractor, the, the installer, the manufacturer, but that really is outside of your scope of purview because you're only really seeking a claim against the insurance company. Unless it was your house. I was assuming it was your house. <laughs> well, I apologize. I didn't realize it was your house. That was my assumption. Okay. All right. So we took that picture and we took a look under that window and take a look how bad that area to the left was. You can see it was a pretty good indication that that area was pretty wet inside the wall. They have came out with some really cool things now. Uh, again, CE courses, we don't just talk about all damage, we talk about solutions as well. Do you remember I told you about the doormat where the wrinkle was? There was airflow and it was dry and you picked it up, but it was wet everywhere but the wrinkle. What they said was we need to make doormats to put on the house. So now they make three-dimensional house wrap, which actually those blue things that you see there are basically thick paint to never allow a surface to make direct contact with the home. So a lot of people use hardy plank today. They'll put this up first. You can nail it tight, but those blue paint on there will allow the air to flow behind it. Same with stucco. There's a little heavier duty one than this for stucco, but this will now allow that air to continue to flow and not allow the, re the rot to occur. Again, Tyvek, good product. When you don't have a water transfer surface like stucco, have you you've seen a stucco house after the rain, right? Or the cement? How many people here have went out and washed the sidewalk? You don't stop washing until it's all the same color, right? All you're doing is saturating the cement with water. It's soaking it up. The only way for cement to dry is the water to come up. It cannot dry by going down. So that unevenness and color till you get it all right? Well, stucco is the same way. It's absorbing that water. Till the point of what I call it the sliced banana. So you ever slice a banana with the knife? The first piece stays on the knife. The second piece pops off the knife. When the stucco finally gets filled with water, that's the first slice of water, the first slice of banana. The second bit of water that goes into saturated stucco pushes that water into the property. Basically how that works. Bill, can you hear, can you hear us online with questions? So EFIS is in the stucco category, but EFIS is actually just paint. EFIS is um, elastomeric paint. It's a rubberized uh, paint, and they install that on top of a styrofoam. It's called outsulation, not insulation. They install it on top of Metro's building is EFIS. So you can actually go up to Metro's building with your finger and put a hole in the building. It's literally that soft. So there's a small little cement coating on top of the styrofoam, and then the paint is applied in a trowel to give it that finish. That's an EFIS finish. Very, EFIS is far worse for holding moisture in because the paint on EFIS is waterproof. So if there's a penetration, a hole in an EFIS system and water gets in, such as around a window, it can't get out. So it, it doesn't, it can't go anywhere. So it gets stuck, trapped, creates rot very quickly. EFIS homes are difficult to insure. Uh, so here's a, a two-part mesh system that is actually designed for stucco. So if, has anyone ever seen a ridge vent up close? A hip over ridge vent? It's basically a thick screen kind of foamed over. And then you put the shingles right over it and that allows airflow into the top of the roof. This is much like a ridge vent for your home. It's very thick, it's about three eighths of an inch. You know, probably about half close to the width of a pinky. Um, when this is applied to the home, you can nail stucco, do whatever you want, but you'll never be able to fully adhere the masonry to the home. It'll always be away from the home, about three eighths of an inch. So they put a water batter behind it, a three eighths airflow in front of it. You can install stucco in this and it will never rot the property. Steve? I don't have anything to add to that. So remember I showed you that kick out flashing in the beginning, uh, that stucco I used the laser to point to? That's what's happening in behind that wall. So that step out flashing right there was missing and it caused that water to just continually run down behind the house. Pardon? So as it stands just right there, it may not be a good claim. 
all of the factors that are built into the claim could be. If I can identify some interior damage, if we can identify other spots of the house that have uh, stucco failure, and we could tie that together to an event. I know it's not the easiest claim in the world, but th these are big upside claims. When you, uh, when you encounter this, especially with a better policy that has some hidden decay coverage, you can end up with a decent claim for this. One thing I'd like to add to this, going back to that um, complaint that I said that was filed by the Attorney General's office, one of the reasons why I think it's important for you to all read that in conjunction with what we're talking about is it does a really good job of explaining the method by which stucco is installed on a house. And I think it's in, incumbent upon any public adjuster who's going to be handling stucco damage claims to understand the process uh, by which this is done. And it will make you understand any engineer's report significantly. Uh, you'll, it's significantly easier to understand any engineer's report if you have that background knowledge. So even if you didn't read anything else, I would suggest that you read that complaint uh, because it does give that analysis. It was such a well done complaint, Cutler filed bankruptcy immediately. You know, because it was so well put together, they've been dealing with this from a bunch of attorneys. I know the law firm that represented me was handling quite a few stucco cases simultaneously. But it does under, if you don't understand the actual process, it does lay it out and how it should be. So what you're looking at right there, that's fiber cement siding, much like Hardy. Hello, plant. hello. Hey yep. guys, excuse me. I just got a quick question here from Govind Patel, excuse me. If, uh, if plywood sheathing is agreed to, agreed to be paid by the insurance, can it trigger or, or trigger to pay for a new roof to be replaced as they cannot replace roofing plywood without removing the shingles? That is the position we're stating. If they agreed to replace the plywood in order to do that, it happens all the time with rafter claims. Um, it happens with insulation claims in the city where you can't access the insulation without pulling the roof. So yes, if they agree to replace the plywood, uh, for whatever the case may be, it may trigger full roof coverage. And then lastly, excuse me, just for our virtual attendees, if you're asked a question in the audience, if you could please just repeat it live, that'd that, be great for the attendees. Thank you. No problem at all. That's a good, uh, good reminder. So this is fiber cement siding, kind of a side view, kind of hardy plank what's out there today. I think this building is fiber cement, to tell you the truth. Um, and that is on top of that two-part barrier. And you can see how much airflow would be behind that siding uh, by the side view. And that would be vertical on the wall. So you can clearly see that air would flow cleanly behind there and won't have any rot issues whatsoever. So the nail holes are not filled. Uh, the, the nail holes are significant as far as stucco failure goes. Um, so there is no, uh, we'll call it like water and ice shield, which is self-sealing. Uh, but the membrane itself, you have the, the yellow 3 a thick membrane, and then you do have an air barrier behind that between the three of those. The nail in this case is covered by this, the piece of siding above it. So it's never a visible or exposed surface nail. So you won't have any trouble with that as well. So depending on the... So you're going back to the metallic, bimetallic reaction issues as well with electrical. The nail that is specified for the material is required. I don't know if Hardy is a stainless requirement or not. Uh, it could be galvanized, it could be a brass uh, requirement. But I can tell you the, the material of the fastener is part of proper code installation. So if you're putting in, uh, I'll give you a great example, stucco has to have a galvanized nail because the wire behind stucco is galvanized. And if you had a stainless steel nail with galvanized wire behind it, the second it touched the wire, it would start a corrosion and cause almost immediate failure. So with Hardy, you're not dealing with that, you're dealing with cement and framing. But uh, with stucco, I know it has to be galvanized because the wire behind the stucco is galvanized. Yep. yep.
So the question is a correction to the Govin Patel calling question. Uh, Don Adamchek is trying to restate it. And Don states that what if you replaced the roof and identified the rotted plywood? My understanding was the question was if they agreed to replace plywood, would you then get paid for the roof to access the plywood? So if you're replacing a roof and identified rotted plywood from a non-event, unless you have a triggered hidden decay coverage endorsement in your policy, that be your expense because the roof was at your expense to begin with. So a rotten fungus endorsement is triggered even without a covered loss to start the coverage. So in other words, when I pull my roof apart for a maintenance scenario, that rotten endorsement is available for identified hidden decay. I'm not fully understanding. No, I, 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 Go ahead. I Let understand. Steve answer. He he does. He knows Adam Check. I don't. Um, so it's a, I, I almost got to that language. I, no, I I understand the question, and I'm going to say I've never seen that exact scenario, but my inclination is to say no, because you had already begun a construction process when you found the. Um, when they found the rotted wood. And since the roof had already been taken off, by the time that you, uh, by the time that you found the rotted wood, that would be part of your expense in your reconstruction um, uh, or the, your replacement of your roof as opposed to a covered loss. And it was not removed because you had to get to the rotted, to the rotted. Uh, I completely agree with Steve, and now I understand what you were asking. I, and not, under those circumstances where the construction had not yet begun, um, I certainly would not volunteer the fact that you were going to replace the roof anyway, and I would make the um, I would make it a claim as part of the roof. With with coverage for hidden decay. You can get the roof as part of the hidden decay. First time you went in the attic. The first time it's discovered. Hidden, hidden decay is the first time you, you, you identify it. If you've never been in the attic and you go up in the attic and you move the Christmas presents out or Christmas boxes and you see it, I would argue that was hidden. It doesn't say it has to be permanently hidden. It doesn't say it has to be hidden by building materials. It just says it has to be hidden. I've never been in my attic. I say it was hidden. I've, I have actually never lost an argument on hidden other than one on an exterior where they park their lawnmower under the decay every week. And they said clearly he could see it. He parked his lawnmower here every week. But other than that, I've never lost one. So I, I don't, I see your point, And I do believe it still meets the criteria of hidden when they first, when they first discovered it. Another question over there. That makes no sense. Well, Bill is saying that the, as long as there's any coverage for the replacement of the sheathing, then they have to replace the roof in order to replace the sheathing. So if there is hidden decay coverage and under your scenario, you have, uh, you have a ceiling that had water damage, you cut it open and now for the first time you're seeing Damaged, um, damaged sheathing under those circumstances, assuming there's coverage for hidden decay in the policy, then the roof should also be replaced because you can't replace the sheathing without, replace, without removing the, the, uh, the roofing material. Does it have to be hidden decay? Because we talked about the fact that there's more ideas on the 
Well, your, your argument says that I can make claim for rotted plywood, you have a period of time exclusion. So you don't have your period of time exclusion for your water stain that you were able to get covered, but the second I open that up, it's not the fault of the plywood, it's not the fault of the roof, it's a repeat seepage leak. We're gonna pay our ensuing damage, but we're not gonna pay our damage that occurred over a period of time. Hence the hidden decay endorsement, which is meant to address those items. But it, you may, you can get the, even without a hidden decay, decay um, endorsement, you may get that kind of damage to the sheathing with a water damming claim. And uh, under those circumstances, you're going to have to replace the sheathing and the, the shingles are not going to be damaged. Or you can have a war, you can have seepage as a result of a worn and torn roof with an ensuing loss provision. It's going to cover, it's going to cause damage to the sheathing. And again, you may not have a storm event that actually damaged the, the, the roof material, but it damaged the material beneath the roof. And as you move, as you get away from the idea of it being plywood and be getting into USB board, that's even more um, of an occurrence because it disintegrates relatively quickly. So talking about OSB, which Steve just uh, alluded to, this is inside of either a, an attic or a framed wall. It's a two by four there, so it's not a thick cavity. But that's basically what you're identifying, pulling down insulation or getting into that area where you had not seen it. So that would be covered under a mold endorsement and that would be covered under hidden decay as well if we were able to trigger that coverage. This is where the value of stucco comes in because it's not an easily replaced or repaired item. Not like vinyl siding that gets detached and reset. This can buy and cover large areas of the claim. Well, actually in terms of buying large areas of the coverage, I wanted to get into this and was looking for a segue. Um, you're going to face, because of the expense involved in replacing an entire house of stucco, you're going to get into issues of matching. Now, they'll want to do core testing in places where there was, there, in other places which would say which portions of the stucco have to be removed in order to replace the damaged sheathing underneath it. Now, there are some policies that have anti-matching provisions, and there's one policy, Erie, which has um, an anti-matching provision that's just for roofing and, siding. roofing and siding. And it's specifically made for this kind of scenario. One of the things you have to look at under those circumstances is the loss settlement provision. If the loss settlement provision requires the repairs to be made with materials of like kind and quality. I don't care how much the insurance company jumped up and down and screams that we don't owe for matching, they do. Even with an anti-matching provision, I have never lost that argument. Bec it's, a, it's a long sentence. It's, so a long, it's a long sentence. So your question is, the loss settlement provision may override the anti-matching language because the loss settlement provision says it must be repaired with like kind and quality. Now, I have successfully argued on numerous occasions that you can't have an anti-matching provision when like kind and quality is required. And the reason is it's completely antithetical to the requirements of the policy. And it's what I said earlier. An insurance company cannot be allowed to pay for a repair that cannot be made. And if you can't provide like kind and quality, then you can't have an anti-matching provision. That way they have to replace everything. And keeping in mind, again, this is a replacement cost policy, which is designed to put the insured in a better position, and when you have mismatched siding, they don't, because that reduces the value of the home. So, um, Mike Sergio is asking how you cap stucco 
Can you describe the uh, wall or the location you're trying to ask? Generally, an exterior wall on stucco ends at the soffit. So they may put what's called like a C channel or a termination bar where the stucco goes up and fits inside of a metal channel. And that becomes the top edge of that. Much like J channel on siding, and that'll be the top and they'll stucco right into that and the final edge of the stucco. Certainly on wood framing, you'll have a termination strip like that. On masonry, they just float it thin. Well, like kind and quality is, there's case law that basically says, uh, like kind and quality, it has to be sufficiently similar in terms of size, color, appearance. Substantially similar. Substantially similar in terms of like, uh, in terms of um, size, shape, appearance, color, uh, texture, and whatnot to meet, to meet the policy. Now, I can go to a more basic definition, and that is if you look up the word like, it means both similar to and the same as. And there's a clear ambiguity under those circumstances. So if it's the same as, if the ambiguity has to be resolved in favor of the insured, then it has to be defined as the same as. Now, I personally was involved in a case in the Eastern District involving slate shingles, uh, excuse me, yes, yeah, slate shingles on a roof. And we had a contractor who said that there's nothing on the market that's sufficiently similar to meet the requirements of like kind and quality. I won the case. Um, the, now, but not every policy says like kind of quality. The State Farm says, I think, State Farm policy says um, similar construction and use. So whether you can beat a matching clause is going to depend on the express language that's contained in the law settlement provision. I'm sorry, yes. Um, I haven't looked. I haven't looked at it from that perspective, but if the arg I think, excuse me, the question was, can you beat the, um, the matching question by talking about the moisture barrier uh, going around the corner? Um, I personally don't know how a moisture barrier is installed. I think Bill can probably give more, uh, more inf information about that. But if, you're, if the argument, as I understand it, is that the Tyvek or the anti or the or the air the, barrier the air barrier has to be um, connected in a certain way for having continuity. Then the argument would be that any place that you have to replace the air barrier, you would have to replace the stucco, regardless of any anti-matching provision, and that becomes part of the necessary repair as opposed to a matching argument. So the question was. If the vapor barrier beneath the stucco, let's say the insurance company had agreed to replace one wall, we're into a matching scenario. And you said, wait a minute, you can't replace one wall. And the question was, because the code requires wrapping of the moisture barrier around to the next surface, would that allow them to not break the stucco at one wall because the repair would go further? It's a valid argument. So it's it, that argument, if you take it to the the common everyday use of that vapor barriers behind drywall in basements when they do a two foot flood cut for drywall if there's a plastic vapor barrier they need to pull the wall down to put the vapor barrier in full before they re-drywall the wall so the same argument works with drywall i've never had that actual case with stucco even with siding i've never had that argument but i do like the argument it certainly seems valid um, go ahead. Well, I have always maintained, and again, this is a, exactly the same argument. If the if the roof was of the same appearance, a uniform appearance before the loss, it needs to be a uniform appearance after the loss. 
And although there's not anything in the policy that, in most policies, that specifically talks about diminution of market value, I'm always going to make the argument that if a authorized repair, it, that they can't allow an authorized repair that will diminish the value because, again, that's putting the insured in a worse position than they were before. And um, it's the same argument as to slopes. It has, it's the same argument as to flooring. It's the same argument in, in all these circumstances. If there's like kind and quality that's required, like kind and quality is required. Now, going to the other scenarios beyond like kind and quality where you have something like state farms equivalent construction and use, the, the diminished value of the home can be, a, um, uh, can be a winning argument. But if you're going to do that, you probably need to get an opinion from a realtor about the um, diminution of the value with a mismatched roof. I can't say diminution. I hate that word. So, Luann, your question, though, with the water and ice shield, that's a field seamable product. Uh, because it's a gel structure, so it is seamable in, in you don't have to worry about overlap. But a good question. I like a, the argument. And there was I a think question about. here. Uh, about Tepco, if Tepco, they want to trade for a or one size, you have a cold one, you can use All of those arguments are valid. So any of the joining arguments uh, are valid. Uh, cement stucco itself uh, cures its entire life. So the day you install stucco, it's about 28 to 30 days before it's even actually reasonably dry. And then it gets drier and harder every day for its entire life until it fails. That's yeah. why Vet Stadium actually had to be taken down because the concrete just keeps getting harder. Real, real cool answer though, as they started doing just a few years ago, restoring the Colosseum. They learned that they produce cement differently in the Colosseum <clears throat> and are now changing the formula that we use for concrete in the United States based on what they learned from the Colosseum. Now, one thing about matching that I do want to address that's actually con almost contrary to what I said, you have to be careful in stucco cases if the stucco has previously been painted. Now, if the stucco has never been painted, it would always be my position that you can't paint it as part of your repair. You can't patch it and then paint it because that's not what the insured had before. It's a nightmare to paint stucco. It's a lifetime commitment of maintenance. Now, on the other hand, though, if it has previously been painted, they will never pay for the replacement of all the stucco if it just has to be patched. They will patch it and then repaint the entire house because that's what the insured had before. I, in fact, I just ran into this situation where I was um, acting as an insured's appraiser where the umpire found out that the house had previously been painted, and I couldn't disagree with the argument that the cracks that were caused by a tornado could be patched and repainted to match the rest of the house. I, I couldn't get a full replacement of the stuff. We're going to fly through just a couple more slides. We're about out of time. I'm actually going to skip this one. Falling of ice and snow creates stucco claims, by the way. Falling of ice and snow happens around the perimeter of a house, along the eaves, generally happens with a house without water and ice shield. The wall cavity gets saturated, the damage begins. If you find homes with interior damage related to the falling of ice and snow, which we had a huge amount of uh, this winter on the East Coast, you, most, you have a potential. I would ask your adjuster if you have the interior damage and it's a stucco home to take a look thermo thermally the, the thermal camera to make sure that cavity is still dry and still okay. Access is access. I don't know where we go with this. Oh, so if we have a plumbing situation with, let's say, a shower failure on an exterior wall and the sheathing is wet from the shower failure, and it's possible that the sheathing is now in that rotted scenario, and the only way to replace that sheathing, because it's on the exterior of the house, has to be from removal of the stucco. So there are claims where we go in for plumbing losses in a shower and the stucco becomes part of that loss. Mold certainly allows for coverage as well and it gives us the access to get to it. So if you do find mold coverage in a policy and they have a stucco home, that is the avenue we would approach, try and find 
a way to attribute the mold on an exterior wall to a stucco to then gain access, to then allow for stucco, to then argue for continuous. Uh, there are dry and wet rot limits in many policies. And we made it to the end and it is 20 seconds early. If you have any questions, we're all done. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. So it's not a report, it's a complaint. Lawsuit. And if you, it's, um, I don't, I know it was filed by the Attorney General's filed office. Filed again, was, put in David Cutler. Cutler Attorney General claim, it'll come up. Um, and if you can't find it, email me, I, have, I, I know where to find it. Guys, we have a night class in here tonight, then we have the pool party. Uh, so don't forget the pool party is, uh, drinking is covered all night. Anthony picked that up last night. So um, tonight, night class in here. We have one more class. Do you know what time that class starts? Six o'clock? Six what? 6.45, so in an hour and a half. So I'll see you all in an hour and a half.